My name is Edward Lonis Jr. I am an enrolled member of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation. I currently serve as the chairman of the board at Diversity Foundation Inc., a Minnesota nonprofit organization committed to bridging the cultural gap between and among all people. I am also a direct descendant of both Sioux Dakota Chiefs Juanetta and his son Juanatan Little Charger, who once lived and called Rochester area and the southern Minnesota their original homeland up until the U.S. Dakota War of 1862. My ancestors were among those imprisoned at Fort Snelling and who were later forcibly exiled from Minnesota. Since 1995, Diversity Foundation's Executive Director Lyle Rustead and myself have helped organize and facilitate many intercultural reconciliation and outreach activities among our neighboring Great Plains Indian reservations where many of my Dakota relatives continue to struggle and live under nearly third world conditions. While working to build support for economically deprived reservation communities, the Diversity Foundation has photographed and filmed extensively to illustrate both recent and historical experiences of Dakota, Lakota, Nakota people in the Upper Midwest. In addition to reconciliation events, it has filmed many interviews among elders, veterans, and other tribal leaders and educators, including extensive reflections upon the lives and historical conditions of their people. Following are excerpts from some of these interviews. I've been very fortunate to have been uh, elected to two terms and now in my second term. My responsibility to continue my father's work, there needed to be understanding between the uh, Indian and the non-Indian people. There are the stereotypes uh, that have always been portrayed are not really true. I thought it was important that uh, Shakti continue to be involved and now we have the resources uh, to be able to get out and support these kinds of uh, groups that are fostering this understanding. So we stopped in Mankato restaurant down here, about six of us, and a group of kids come in. Then they were making slurs about, well, we hung 48 of you, you know, and they said we might just uh, hang another six. So we just quietly got up. We didn't pay them, got up, and we left. And I figured that if we ever brought the powwow and get the white people to mix with the Indians and make these people realize that we're not uh, uncivilized, still keep our own tradition going. And then I called Amos Owen, and it didn't take him but one second to say, all right, well, I'll be there. I'll We'll start our meetings right away, and I'll contact uh, other tri leaders from the other tribes, and we'll get something going. And uh, the three of us uh, formed, the, I guess, the nucleus of it. And uh, then Amos' wife, I own, and his brother-in-law, Wally Wells, and Gertrude, his wife, Norman and Edith Crooks, uh, uh, Amos and Rose Crooks, Big Dave Larson, and uh, Chief Wabashaw and his wife, Vernell composed the uh, committee that we had. Amos and Rose, they were there and they talked about uh, their understanding of the culture and, and the, you know, the understanding of the ceremonies and they did both the traditional, they were both traditional dancers. I think it's uh, been a great uh, thing for that organization to start those powwows down here and bring people back. As I look back on it now, uh, was a committee of dedicated people who never debated anything, never argued. They just came up with ideas and they worked out the, their thoughts, the, the ideas they had into action. And it was just a pleasure working with them. And that's one reason why I, I, I come back to this land when I come out of service. And I applied for this land when I married her where we're living at now, where Mystic Lake is, that land belonged to me, 40 acres. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with that 40 acres, I figured... So you were the beginning of the reservation? Yeah. We were the first yeah, ones we on there. we were the first oh, ones that... Really yeah. We were the first ones that started the reservation. There's only wow. five of us. And, uh, what year was that, then, that you bought 54. That yeah. My thing I wanted to do is bring all these people, all my brothers and sisters, back. That 40 acres was just the prime thing. 
uh, we have to uh, be able to interact and understand each other to go forward and that's uh, I think the legacy that uh, my, my folks and Amos Owens and them uh, is coming true. My name is Robert Bone. I am from the Dakota Nation of Sioux Valley, Manitoba, Canada. A member of the Flandreau Santee Sioux Tribe, but I do not speak Dakota. I speak Lakota. My name is Rick Thomas. Uh, Indian name is Tatankamani, which is a walking buffalo. Uh, which was a war chief after the 1862 Minnesota Uprising. Lyle uh, Roostad came to us, uh, to the city, about 10 years ago. And he came because he had promised Ernie, Chief Wabashaw, that he would find where his relatives were buried. And Lyle went down to the mayor, the mayor sent him to me in City Hall. He then uh, brought the uh, Unity Riders uh, quickly in 98, I think it was, to uh, Winona from uh, Manitoba, from what's called Sioux Valley. Yeah, Big Eagle, I'm from the Crow Creek Sioux Indian Reservation in South Dakota. I'm a descendant of, great, great descendant of uh, Chief Big Eagle. My name's uh, Rod Steiner, and I'm uh, enrolled at the uh, Santee Sioux Nation of Nebraska. I've always heard white people tell me how the government had cheated us out of our land and boy you guys really got took and I always used to think to myself well they're still doing it and why don't you help us. Uh, Lyle has always said that this could be a model for the way Indians and white people should get along. history there's a uh, our grandfathers were in jail together so <laughs> we've got that tie and so it's it's been it's been good to meet them and they're just really good people <laughs> well thank you <laughs> appreciate <laughs> that that's that sort of a Kodak moment this was my chief and I see some descendants of other chiefs that are here uh, little crow and Descendants of Red Wing and I think Husha Sha and the Big Eagles. So our chiefs are, are still around, some of the descendants, and I think we're the only that has a hereditary chief that uh, went from father to son. The Wabashaws are the only ones left in, in this capacity, and, and we're sure proud of that. And I want to talk about some of the things that, that our women went through here that really, really suffered here. Uh, the first contact with the white men and how they dealt with us on the land and, and, and everything that they, they did to us and, and tried to help us and then reneged on some of the things and, and it, it showed what, what the Indian policy was to our particular tribe. And, and one thing, there was just a few lines in there about Crow Creek, they said, well, when the women got up here, they were picking the half digested grain out of the horse manure to make soup. And then it said that many respectable women turned to prostitution to support their families. And all of us here, a lot of us here, came from those women probably that suffered here. And that's why when, when we put this monument up, and I'd read that way before we ever thought about this monument, and when I thought about what our women went through here, and then I thought about my Dakota grandmothers and all that, I counted 16 Dakota women that I was raised around. At Santee. My great grandmother, my grandmother, my great aunts, and all my mother's siblings, cousins that helped raise me. All the love they showed me. And they were strong, resourceful women. And I thought, well, I think that came from here. When you go through something like that up here, you pass that on to your children. We're at the Holy Faith uh, Cemetery at uh, the Hobo Creek area near Santee, Nebraska. This is Wabasha III. He was the uh, third in the line of Wabasha chiefs. Uh, he uh, was chief during the Minnesota uprising of uh, Dakota Indians in Minnesota in uh, 1862. Uh, that's our homeland, Minnesota. And, uh, it was a short war and after it was over, uh, all the Dakota were banished from the state of Minnesota. and. Uh, 
uh, first they were kept that first year at Fort Snelling in uh, St. Paul and then uh, the next year they were shipped by boat down to St. Louis and then up the Missouri River to uh, Crow Creek, South Dakota, but it was uh, such a barren and harsh land that uh, about half of the tribe died there. People coming up to me and shaking my hand, they called me a chief, they said, they, oh, they would ask me who my parents were, and they'd tell them, and they'd say, well, you're our chief, and they'd shake hands. They were going to bury a Indian kid out there and that got killed in the war, and I don't know which tribe he was, but either Omaha or Winnebago. All the Indians started coming to the funeral, and they stopped the funeral. The re what we call a reservation town is the town next to the reservation. You always have prejudice there. I don't care. They can say they don't, but it's, it's there. The uh, reason why I'm sitting up here is because the IRS on December 3rd uh, auctioned off 7,000 112 acres of Crow Creek land. This, this land that they're auctioning off, 11 square miles, 7,000 acres, is our prime, about the third largest in the United States for wind energy. You know, it's, uh, it's for economic development, uh, jobs for our people, possibly even free electricity. But why take this land? Why do you want this land? You took the Black Hills, you took our bottom lands, put in dams, you made us move then again, promised us free electricity with the hydro dam sitting right beside us. Never happened. Now you look at today, you're taking our land again. Wind energy land. Indian land. Not for sale. Historically, there's never been a president of the United States who spoke, spoke well of Indians. And you might ask the question, why? It's because they wanted the land, and they wanted the Indians out of the way. I was elected after World War II. I came back and got elected to the uh, tribal leader. There was no government then. I worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs on Standing Rock, and then I worked for the three governors of South Dakota. And I made about four or five trips to Washington at that time on tribal matters. Then the other problem I encountered as a tribal leader was the, 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 the harnessing of the Missouri River. At one time, all of this land was ours. In 1943, when I was still in the service, the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, went before Congress and told them what they were going to do. They were going to harness the Missouri River to generate power and um, irrigation and control flooding and all that stuff, you know. But they never told the tribe. Cindy, I know she, she's a, a doctor and she carries an important role. She prefers that and that's really cool because in a way, you know, that's the humility that we have as humans. You know, so Cindy here will help. Many people want to understand. And so then how do you help them understand the context of the evolution of how this country was settled? Minnesota was Dakota country. Our heart, our soul belongs to our original homelands. How much do they know about that land, that place, and that it's the origins for the Dakota people? And so what better way through helping Diversity Foundation, Santi, uh, Dakota Nation, or Crow Creek, or Lower Brew, or Shakopee, or whatever Dakota Nation that's here today, um, to create this business enterprise in the heart of this amazing medical complex in Rochester. My name is Roger Trudell. I'm the chairman of the Santee Sioux Nation from uh, northeast Nebraska. I'm in Rochester looking at an economic opportunity in a partnership with Diversity Foundation of Minnesota to create an economic enterprise in the Kaler Hotel it's across the street from the Mayo Clinic. My name is Red Olson here at Fort Thomas, South Dakota. 
We're currently at the Episcopal Cemetery here at Fort Thompson. I'm Wes Peterson. I'm from Rochester, Minnesota. I'm a member of Trinity Presbyterian Church in Rochester. My name is Harry Quilt. I'm a Lord Blue Sioux Indian. A group from Rochester is here with us today, and they come every summer, you know, once a month uh, during the summer months to help us uh, restore some of the broken down monuments and to take care of the cemetery as it was neglected for years and years. I guess the person that really got it started was was Lyle Rustat, if you guys know him. So, well, he asked if this was possible and said, yes, it is. And who would want to come to Fort Thompson and do something like that? Reconciliation. Our people could be the most bitter because of all the terrible things that we have had to endure. But there is a better way. It's a gift of Wakantaka, Great Spirit God. It's a gift of love. So with that, I will read the City of Rochester Proclamation. And whereas throughout their long history, the Great Dakota Nation has traditional and cultural ties to the state of Minnesota, even to the great city of Rochester. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I want to mention the fact the women played a key role in the World War II effort. Not long ago, about a month ago, there was a, uh, a woman by the name of um, Mildred. She lives in Edgemont, South Dakota who was a WASP, that's a women air service pilot. She went through all the training as, as a regular pilot to be a WASP. And they, I remember them as an Air Corps man that they transported the planes across the country to, to this, the active, active flyers. And uh, she will be receiving a gold medal of honor. When you first met Marcella, you were in, what was the name of the group? The Niowa. Niowa is North American Indian Women's Association. And, uh, and she, I guess, was at Cheyenne River? Right. They talked about a lady from the Cheyenne River, Marcella Lebeau. And she was recognized by the country of France. My Lakota name was Pretty Rainbow Woman. I had one of the greatest honors and privileges of my life to serve as an army nurse during World War II. We took care of patients from D-Day. Then later we went to Liège, Belgium, where we took care of patients from the three campaigns. And the reason why they picked the, to be coat doctors during the war because all 567 Indian tribes spoke a different language. If the enemy captured one and they tried to torture him to, to give the secrets out about what they were saying on different missions, they couldn't he said, Yeah, I don't understand that rule. I am 100 percent in them. I can read and write the Lakota language. The general said, okay. Then you're going to be my radio operator. I am just a young kid. Yes, we're called Dakota, meaning friend or ally. We came here to this area 150 years ago. My own grandfather told me many stories about our people when I was young. But some of our memories are hard to speak of. My great-grandfather's brother was among the 38 the 38 who died at the place called Makato, or Blue Earth, back in Minnesota. I'm what they call a spiritual leader. I lead in prayer, lead in different ceremonies. I help with the ceremonies and also well, with the teepees and all. Everything that is here that you see that's um, our way of life. To the dedication of this fountain. Joanne Bird and her husband Gordon. Joanne is the, an artist and a sculptor and is responsible for what you see standing there. My name is Roger Fidel of the Downs, and I'm the chairman of the Sanctuary Nation. 
and I'm quite honored to speak on behalf of Ernest Lobachoff and his family. We are the direct descendants of those uh, individuals that were imprisoned in the uh, state of Minnesota. Yeah, number six. Oh, gosh. What, what does this mean to you and what just happened here? We're home. Yeah. We're home. Yeah. When we do something like this, it has meaning to it. It has cultural meaning to it. It has spiritual meaning to it. To be able to run with the horses, walk with the horses. And uh, as a human, the two, the two, two legged and the four legged, together you got uh, a strong spiritual entity. Yeah. From our governor. August 17th, 1862 marked a terrible period in Minnesota's history. I call for today the 150th anniversary of August 17, 1862 to be a day of remembrance and reconciliation in Minnesota. I ask everyone to remember that dark past, to recognize its continuing harm in the present and to resolve that we will not let it poison our future. To honor the American soldiers, Dakota people, and settlers who lost their lives in that war, I ordered that all state flags shall be flown at half-staff from sunrise to sunset. And I urge everyone participating in the events commemorating this 150th anniversary to practice not only remembrance, but also reconciliation. Governor Mark Dayton, governor of Minnesota. It was my story. It was your story. It was everybody's story that's standing where they are right now. 150 years, this is where we are. How did we get here? We all can read the history books, hear the stories, but we all have our stories. What got us here? What's going to get us back here in another 150 years? My Dakota name is Two Arrows. My Christian name is uh, Peter Lenkeek. And uh, I am uh, the staff keeper of the Sacred Eagle staff, the uh, 38 plus two staff, and uh, this is my third year. Let me share, Tahina Town, let me in. My Indian name is, uh, charges the enemy in sight. My uh, Christian name is Jim Miller. So when I got this dream in 2005, uh, that December, we started the ride. And so to have a dream, you try to fulfill it. If you believe that it comes from the Creator, and I believe that this came from the Creator to talk about Minnesota's greatest secret, the hanging of our relatives. Ancestral uh, lands are mainly around the Minnesota area, and uh, so knowing a little bit of that history that, that took place back in the 1860s and, and, and so forth, um, we uh, we uh, came up with the idea for a ride to remember our people. Talk about reconciliation, coming together, uh, healing old wounds, and moving forward. And uh, as, as far as what I've seen at Winona, man, great. You know, keep it up. It's beautiful. You know.
Brandon Sanzu, chairman of the Crow Creek Sioux Tribe. Today we got the diversity foundation here. We got Ed in the red hat over here who's the chairman of the diversity foundation. Earlier they dropped off a lot of mattresses and in the past the diversity foundation was so fortunate to do the Toys for Tots drive during a blizzard. I mean that that's something. <laughs> I was here during a blizzard man. Lyle drove, drove miles through a blizzard. Interstates closed, they made it here, they got it done. I'm the chairman of the Diversity Foundation, and we're here as part of our outreach with uh, the Crow Creek, and uh, this is one of the many trips we've made out here in the last couple of years. My name is Danita Loudner, and I'm an enrolled member of Crow Creek Outreach by bringing in semi-loads of toys for Tots and our mattresses. They did a Lions Club helped us secure a Lions Club mobile unit to come in and do some screening where we found 80% of our individuals had high blood pressure and without them we couldn't have gotten anybody to help sponsor the Lions Club. We had to reach all the way to Minnesota. It's one of the big things other than the outreach that you guys do. You know, it's a lot more than just bringing in the mattresses. It's... Lyle and Ed Lonis deserve a lot of credit for bringing out uh, what we are all about. Special thing when you give a start quilt away or present it to somebody that they may have a long and prosperous life. This film represents a small sampling of the Diversity Foundation's work. It has included scenes at reconciliation and healing ceremonies and interviews in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan, as well as Minnesota. With the support of the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota Oyate, these thousands of photos and hours of video could be transformed into documentaries telling stories of the original people and communities of the Upper Midwest in ways that would be used in educational institutions and that would educate all of us who were indoctrinated into a colonized view of American history. Working together, we could advance reconciliation among all of our people, among descendants of immigrants and slaves, as well as First Nations people, 
and enable deeper understanding among all of us of our common history. This should also enhance support for programs that strengthen economic and social conditions in reservations and urban indigenous communities. Thus, we are appealing for support from various sources for completing production of the visual resources we have begun, as well as for the vital human service projects that address needs of economically deprived reservations. <laughs>